let's take a look now at the connection between uh, establishing constructs and then operationalizing them. Operationalizing, operationalization means taking these abstract constructs and making them more concrete, making them more tangible, more real. Uh, one example I provided earlier uh, is that uh, uh, intelligence is a construct, is an abstract idea of something okay, that has to do with human capability. And uh, one, uh, one attempt to operationalize it was uh, to invent the IQ tests, to come up with a way of actually physically measuring uh, what this construct is in, 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 in a practical way, at least the results that we can use in research. Okay, uh, so uh, operationalization then is taking these abstract constructs, making them more uh, concrete, more tangible. Now, going back to our example that we've been using uh, that we, uh, uh, about self-managed teams. If you recall, the theory was that uh, 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 teams that employ self-management are more effective because uh, uh, they lead to higher states of motivation among employees okay, who, who, who believe now that their opinions count and their decisions have an impact. Okay, so uh, one of the things then to, to operationalize, you go to each of these constructs and then you say, okay, what can I do to make this construct less abstract and more concrete? Now, uh, one thing we can do is to uh, take a look at uh, uh, employee. We already discussed briefly, what do we mean by employee? So to operationalize employee, what we may do is to say, okay, uh, in our organization, we, uh, the HR department has divided us into uh, a nine level hierarchy. Okay, everywhere at, at level, uh, 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 let's say the, uh, the, the lower the number of the level, the lower you are in the hierarchy. At level one, that could be the person who mops the floors and sweeps the floors and uh, basically takes care of basic maintenance activities. And then at level nine, that's our highest level, that would be the CEO. Uh, the level eight would be all the senior managers that operate directly under the CEO. And then between level nine and level one is everybody else. So what we may do is, uh, uh, in talking about self-managed teams, is to recognize that uh, basically our people don't even work in real teams until they're, say, level three. Okay, level one is just a, a floor sweeper or someone who's mopping the floors, doing basic work independently. Level two may be a more advanced level, uh, you know, a higher level of this, but it's not until level three that we actually have people, say, working in teams, trying to get things done. Okay, so these may be small teams, very small teams, fitting into larger teams, but at least we can identify some kind of team structure so we can talk about self-managed teams intelligently. And then, based on our particular organization, this kind of team activity uh, uh, where you actually have people working together to achieve goals goes from, say, level three uh, all the way up to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, level six. Okay, so our operationalization of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, an employee will include anybody okay, who works on teams between level three and level six in the hierarchical uh, uh, system that we've created through the HR department. So that's, a, that's one example of operationalization. We really narrowed it down. We're not talking about employees in general terms. We're narrowing it down to people who fall between level three and level six who actually work in a team environment. Now there's still more detail uh, to, to work on and we can do that by defining the variables and actually going out and observing uh, behaviors that we use to fill, provide the data for the variables. Okay, another example of operationalization might be uh, the construct that we identified called motivation. Okay, motivation is really quite abstract. At least an employee, in your mind's eye, you can see physically employees walking around. You've got to narrow down which of those employees count in terms of our study or research. But with something like motivation, we're dealing with something that's a, a pretty intangible. So in operationalizing uh, motivation, we've got to figure out ways of making it more tangible. So it's not just a total abstraction. Uh, so uh, one way to look at motivation, uh, to, to operationalize it, is to look at the opposite of motivation, which would be uh, demotivation or, or the, uh, uh, an environment where nobody really cares about doing a good job. 
And right away, when you talk about environments that people don't care about doing a good job, we, we see that you're going to have higher rates of absenteeism. Uh, you're going to have more uh, workplace-related injuries. Okay, you're going to have uh, uh, probably uh, higher degrees of quality problems in the products that are produced. So by looking at the negative, we can already get some hints as to measures of motivation. Okay, at least we can begin the scale. On a scale of 1 to 6, uh, uh, how good are we, uh, excuse me, a scale of 1 to 5, usually we use a 5 point scale. On a scale of 1 to, point, one to 5, uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how much uh, uh, absenteeism do we encounter in our particular organization that we're studying? Okay, where one would be no absenteeism, say five is lots of absenteeism. Okay, that would be uh, an indirect measure of motivation. Okay, uh, uh, in terms of the quality products that our teams produce on a scale of one to five, uh, how good is the quality? How consistent are these teams able, uh, are the, how consistent are these teams in being able to produce high quality products? Okay, and one might again, one would be good, five would be bad. So one would be uh, totally consistent and capable of producing high quality goods. Five is uh, they just produce trash. So uh, right there with those two measures, and then uh, we also talked about other measures, injuries and so on, uh, coming at it from the negative side, we can see some measures that, that, that dovetail with our attempt to uh, get a handle on uh, motivation. Uh, on a more positive side, what we can do is also, uh, with the employees, say take a random sample of uh, uh, 50 of them and conduct interviews, structured interviews, where we ask them various questions uh, to determine uh, the extent to which they're really charged. Okay, when you wake up in the morning and you think about the office, how do you feel on a scale of 1 to 5? I feel, ooh, I'm just tired, I want to go back to bed. or. Uh, or, or again, in this case, I reverse the scale. So let's say uh, one would be, I feel really great. Okay, I just can't wait to get to the office. Five would be, ooh, I'm feeling uh, kind of tired. I want to crawl back into bed. Okay, so eagerness to get on the job, that's a, that's a measure of uh, motivation. So through the interviews, or you can uh, establish questionnaires. The nice thing about questionnaires is you can send them out to hundreds of people. Uh, interviews, typically you're limited in the number of people you can deal with because they're time consuming. Okay, but anyhow, uh, through these, uh, through an, a direct attempt at contacting the employees through interviews and uh, uh, questionnaires, you may be able to uh, address the question of motivation uh, just outright. You, you don't say to the employees, "Are you motivated?" That that's not going to work. You're not going to get a meaningful response. So what you need to do is come up with four or five or six questions, such as, uh, "How eager are you when you get up in the morning to to get in there and get on the job?" Okay. Uh, 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 that kind of thing uh, gives us a, a quite a good sense. It's an indirect measure uh, on how happy people are and uh, are they fired up uh, to, uh, to work uh, in the uh, work environment. So uh, we just looked at two examples there of uh, how you can operationalize a construct. Uh, clearly, uh, for all the, let's see how many constructs, so I have identified six constructs. For each of those constructs, we can go through a similar process where we take these vague abstractions and make them more concrete, and that's what we need to do.